Hello, and welcome to the Gallimore Free, a hodgepodge history podcast. Uh, we're coming at you straight from the basement of the carpet shop. So thank you for joining us again. My name's Will. I am one of your hosts. I'm joined by your other host, this guy, Nick. How you doing, Nick? I'm doing well. That took you a while. That's all right. It's been a long time. I love how you hold your hands up every time you do the intro, though. I do it involuntarily, or I've started doing it. And I've realized that when you see um, politicians talking, they do the same thing. I don't know if it's something they're trained to do or if it's just something that feels natural. What, yes and no. I mean, you do it in a way that looks like you're saying my fish was this big. Yeah, that's what I'm going for. <laughs> I, I, I want to. Whereas, yeah. whereas they will gesticulate to communicate concepts because it's more memorable. Whereas if you've just got your hands by your side and you're going, I believe in a greater economy, it's, it's like ro- robotic. It's yeah. like watching Theresa May. Theresa May. Yeah. We, we don't want to be the Theresa May of podcasts. We want to be the. We'd yeah. be, we'd want to be a Barack Obama. Uh, could we be a bit Teddy Roosevelt as well? He was actually uh, the uh, who Dr. Robotnik was based on in Sonic the Hedgehog. Was he? Yeah, he was based I can see the resemblance Teddy immediately. Roosevelt. Yeah. yeah. Mm. This episode is not about Teddy Roosevelt or Barack Obama. This is a story about British politics in the modern age, I suppose. Uh, but specifically, the 1960s. So we're going to be talking about one of the greatest British political scandals. Yeah. Of all time. A Mm. scandal that is said to have brought about a shift in the very nature of politics, how politicians were viewed, how the Tory party was made, or the makeup of the Tory party, Mm. and also, um, I guess, in how newspapers report on things, particularly around politicians and things like that. We're going to be taking a look at the Profumo affair. So for anyone who wasn't aware, uh, it was a major political scandal in the United Kingdom in the early 1960s. Uh, which involved uh, an extramarital affair between the Secretary of State for War, John Profumo, and a 19-year-old model called Christine Keeler. This story is basically a sleazy old Tory sleeps with a young model that causes a national scandal. It's, it's a, te- a story as old as time. It is, I was about to say. Yeah. More importantly, it was the birth of the sort of lurid political scandal. 60 years before the B word, the Tories were still at it. Never one to shy away from a good scandal, I suppose. No, never want to shy away from a good scandal. And it's important because Britain was still sort of regimented. It was it was still recovering from the World War. Mm. You know, there were a lot of wartime restrictions still almost in place. You know, there were restrictions on restaurants opening times and food availability on things. People were still conscripted into the army. Like anyone over 18 had to serve a minimum of about 18 months. Mm. So uh, society was also very much geared towards men. You know, it was a... Patriarchy dominated by misogyny in many ways. Women were sort of not seen as people, but as sexual conquest. In fact, there were stories from around the time that women who were out past nine o'clock at night, Mm -hmm. unless they were chaperoned by men, were viewed as prostitutes that were on the game. Because why would any respectable woman be alone past nine o'clock at night? Yeah, it's a bit mad, isn't it? It's very mad. Uh, This was also a time when homosexuality was illegal. And also a time when uh, interracial marriages were also very much frowned upon in polite society. But it was also a time of great cultural and social change. It was, for many, an optimistic time where people were looking ahead to the future. London, specifically in the 1960s, was a real hotspot of uh, emerging trends in music and fashion and art. So things were really kind of moving along. That kind of post-war austerity was gradually being shed and people were looking at a brighter future. Conversely, the government at the time was the uh, notoriously stoic Conservative Party, led by a particularly Conservative Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan. But why is the Profumo affair so important? Because ostensibly, it's just, it's just a, a Tory minister who has an affair with a young lady, which is shocking. But yeah. it, to be honest, it's part and parcel of being a Tory minister, I'd say. Yeah, this is, this is definitely not the first time a Tory minister was caught cheating on his wife. And it definitely wouldn't be the last time. And very rarely do these instances bring down governments. What makes it interesting is the fact that his affair was with Christine Keeler, who was said to be in league with the Russians. How mm. much of this is true is not necessarily known. Yeah. But like all historical stories, they're slightly overblown. And particularly when the media get their teeth into something, they over mm. the facts, air quote. And this was... Uh, one of the early kind of emergencies of what would become the tabloid press that Britain has become so notorious for. 
Indeed, there was it, the Profumo Fed did not just have a lasting effect on the political establishment at the time; it had a fundamental shift on our perception around privacy and uh, perception of public figures. Mm. So there was a shift in the change of what privacy meant. Yeah, there was this weird juxtaposition where people like secretly saying, you know, people should keep themselves to themselves. But in the next minute, they'd be buying the news of the world or the the mirror and reading these lurid stories that they couldn't get enough of. The Second World War had finished 20 years earlier, but there was still a war going on. And that was the Cold War. And this is a bigger topic for another episode. But the Cold War was essentially a time of great paranoia. Yeah, no, indeed. And any 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 notional snifter of Russians hmm. being involved in something caused a great amount of fear, which is ultimately what led to Profumo's downfall. Yeah. Whether or not Kila was a spy, which she was not, <laughs> and whether or not she actually had a relationship with a Russian attaché who was said to be a sort of mischievous, sort of devious spy, mm. is another thing that's open to question. Yeah, but even even if we were to believe that, that the Russians were involved in this and it was all part of this kind of elaborate scheme, this isn't the first time that Macmillan's government had been embarrassed uh, by its run-ins with uh, the Russian secret services. At this point, uh, it had already suffered from the uh, embarrassment of the Portland Spy Ring, which was a, a group of British citizens who were passing off military secrets to the Soviet Union. George Blake, who was a British spy who became a Soviet double agent. And uh, John Vassell, who is probably the most relevant to this story. And Admiralty Clark, who leaked secrets to the Soviet Union, allegedly under threat of his homosexuality being made public. The homosexuality at this point, until 1967, was still a crime in the United Kingdom. And anyone who was found to be homosexual uh, risked not only imprisonment, but losing their jobs, their social standing, their friends. It could break relationships. It was a big, quite a serious stigma. Despite the assumption of blackmail, Vassal was still reimbursed for leaking details of naval technology. At one point, it was noted that he was spending £3,000 a year despite his official Abilty salary being only £750. It doesn't quite correlate, does it, if, if he says, oh, I did it under duress, but also they paid me, you know, two and a half grand. I suppose you wouldn't say no if you're under duress anyway. Yeah, but... you've, got to, you've got to eat somehow. But anyway, these scandals dominated the British press at the time, causing a great deal of embarrassment for Macmillan's government. The Vassal case, as we said, was particularly humiliating after it was found that a minister called Thomas Galbraith had attempted to shield Vassal and was later forced to resign after this was realised. What's important about the Vassal case is that it happened the year before Profumo became a massive issue, which was mm. 1963. So actually, Vassal himself was sentenced on the day the Cuban Missile Crisis began in 1962, ah. in a weird coincidence of history. I mean, it's double conspiracy, isn't it? Because, well, I mean, it, it plays into the paranoia of, of the British culture at the time twice, because not only was he alleged to have been a uh, Soviet double agent, but he was also gay. You know, he had no chance in the papers, did he? No. But yeah, the, the government's heavy-handed approach when it came to the press's reporting on this matter uh, actually had the reverse effect and made the press more bold and more uh, persistent in covering these stories. Before we run through the chronological events, it's important probably just to highlight some of the key characters. As we mentioned, there's John Profumo himself, who was the Minister for War. Yeah, that's quite a lofty title. So obviously he was part of the cabinet, which made him part of the government, which made him a big player at the time. Yeah, but he was also one of the classic Tories. He came from an immensely wealthy and privileged background. He was the Baron Profumo in the nobility of the Kingdom of Sardinia. Well, there you go. So, you know, humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. And he had a very traditional English education. He was educated at Harrow, where mm -hmm. they instilled in him the notion of, you know, can't, you can't think about having sex, you can't talk about having sex, you are posh and brilliant and everyone will love you. Yeah. All I, those classically wonderful British morales. Yes. It's, it's no wonder that British uh, private boys' schools have such a glowing reputation. Yes, but funny enough, he was actually one of the youngest ever MPs ever elected. Mm. He got elected at the age of 25 in 1940 for the seat of Kettering, mm. which always just makes me think of Peep Show where Mark goes and hides behind a bush. <laughs> <laughs> I love that episode. Mark was... Wasn't even supposed to be a history nerd, so maybe he was thinking about Profumo as well. Yeah, yeah. He would eventually lose his seat before then picking up another safe seat. But by all accounts, he was a very sort of charming man. He wasn't physically imposing. He was quite short um, and he was beginning to bald. But he was a very sort of sociable man. Yeah. In fact, by all accounts, he was a rampant, horny devil. Yes, I could believe that. Yeah. 
He often enjoyed partying to the point where he would flirt right openly with a lot of women, including while even dancing with his wife. Right. Which is probably not the best way to get on her good side. And his wife actually was a famous actress named Valerie Hobson. Yeah, she was actually. She was in David Lean's 1946 adaptation of Great Expectations. And also, uh, more importantly, she was in the uh, Ealing comedy Kind Hearts and Coronets. Never seen it, but I'm, I'm sure it's good. It's got Obi-Wan Kenobi in it. You mean Alec Guinness? Obi-Wan Kenobi. Because there's more than one Obi-Wan Kenobi now. The original Obi-Wan Kenobi. Old Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, God. Anyway, he was re-elected in 1950 to the safe seat of Stratford-upon-Avon. He began quite a rapid rise within the Conservative Party because Macmillan remembered him during the war. So mm. during the war, there had been a number of Tory MPs who'd openly rebelled against the government's policy of appeasement. In mm. fact, 33 in total, one of which had been John Profumo, right. being an intelligence officer in the RF. Hmm. He strongly opposed the appeasement, to which him and his 32 other colleagues got a lot of visceral and hatred directed at. So it was the case of him being on the right side of history in the end then. The right side of history at the wrong time. Yeah. But not necessarily the right side of history, because there's, I would argue, there's an argument that Chamberlain's policy of appeasement was vital in preparing Britain for defence against Nazi Germany. Yeah. There is quite a big debate to be had on whether Chamberlain was right to do what he did. It's, again, probably it's, it's for another episode. It's a whole other podcast, yeah. But anyway, so Macmillan picked him to be Minister for Foreign Affairs initially in 1959, based mm. on his memory of him and the fact he was a serving war minister. In fact, Macmillan was very much a sort of old war hero himself. In fact, he was one of, one of only uh, two prime ministers in the last 300 years, mm. of which Attlee was the other one, yeah. that had been wounded in war. Ah. And actually, no, so they'd served in war, they'd wounded in war, they knew what it was like to be a soldier. And Macmillan liked to put people who knew what they were doing in charge of different posts. Profumo became Minister of War in 1960, when mm. there was a cabinet reshuffle. So, again, rapid, quite a rapid rise. And his principal role was actually to get rid of the conscription that was still going on in Britain. Oh, OK. And this had become quite a sore point for a lot of people. <laughs> right. During 1963, there were a couple of by-elections. Over 700 armed forces personnel registered to run for election in an effort to get out of finishing their service. Oh, OK. In the end, only one was ended up being selected. Yeah. But it just shows you the fact that there were so many people unhappy with the fact that conscription was still a, was still yeah. a thing. So Profumo, before the scandal broke, at least, was considered as something of a rising star within the Conservative Party. Uh, many of his peers even predicted him for the spot of Prime Minister someday. So how did this Minister of War end up meeting a 19-year-old model named Christine Keeler? That's the question, isn't it? Hmm. Well, we'll talk about Christine in a second, hmm. but it's important to figure out how the two of them came to meet in the first place. And that involves one very interesting, very charismatic, very narcissistic socialite named Dr. Stephen Ward. An osteopath. Yeah, he's a sort of limb bender, masseuse with ideas above his station. Much to his annoyance. In fact, when he signed up for the war effort in, the, in Britain, hmm. um, he reported as a doctor and they took one look at his doctorate and said... <laughs> <laughs> We're not letting you anywhere near anyone. <laughs> so they made him be a stretcher bearer for the entirety of the war, uh -huh. which was slightly humiliating for someone of his yeah, confidence. Some, someone who, who believed himself to be a proper doctor. Mm. But that did not stop him from having quite a successful practice as an osteopath with quite a number of high-profile clients. This included politicians such as Eden and Churchill, uh, movie stars like Elizabeth Taylor and Ava Gardner, and even King Peter of Yugoslavia. Uh, he was also vain, a show-off, and he preferred what he called alley cats to society women. However, he also enjoyed the companionship and liked women's clutter around his home. Uh, this led him to invite women to come and live with him. Ward is uh, an interesting character in all of this. He's obviously... Uh, doesn't do himself any favours... What makes him important as this sort of combining linchpin was the fact that he hung around with all these society people. He met them through different channels. Hmm. As you said, he had this massive client base, uh, one of which happened to be uh, Lord Bill Astor. Yeah. Who was a sort of Tory and the owner of Clydeson Estate. Now, Clydeson Estate would become really important because it's the place where basically Ward would hold a lot of his parties. So Astor had actually introduced back in 1949. And obviously this took him to... Ward. They quickly became friends. He would give Ward use of his grounds. He even lent him large amounts of money at times. And Ward would hold parties for dignitaries, 
special selected dignitaries at Cliveston, while Cliveston will also host more formal dinners at the same time. Interesting thing about Bill Astoy, something I thought was interesting. He'd actually inherited through his family. He was the um, the descendant of William Waldorf Astor, famous for the uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. So they were that family of Astors. They were very, very successful, uh, very rich. I think at one point, one of the Astors was the second richest person in America after uh, Rockefeller. And yet they still had back trouble. Yeah. Just can't escape it, rich or poor. No. Comes for us all. Let's talk about Keela herself, the woman at the centre of this scandal. Yeah, so unlike uh, John Profumo, the the other big player in this story, uh, Christine Keeler was not born into wealth and privilege. Uh, she was born in 1942 in Uxbridge. Uh, what is it about Uxbridge and scandals involving lying conservative politicians? <sighs> she must be in the water. <laughs> Her, uh, her father abandoned the family in 1945, leaving her mother, Julie Ellen, and stepfather, Edward Hewish, to bring up the family in a house uh, which was made from two converted railway carriages in Raysbury in Berkshire. So um, that, would be a, that would be a sort after living accommodation today, I think. It would be. But two carriages? Two carriages. That's, that's a mansion, isn't it? I'd be lucky to have one. <laughs> but it, it was, however, a far cry from Profumo's uh, privileged upbringing. Keeler's childhood was not a happy one. Uh, she suffered not only from malnutrition, but was also uh, sexually abused at the hands of her stepfather and his friends. Uh, when she was 17, Keeler gave birth to a child, a child of a United States Air Force sergeant with whom she was having an affair. Uh, the child was born prematurely and died after six days. So um, it wasn't a, it wasn't a happy childhood, and it seems wherever she went, she was taken advantage of or abused. Even though, like her first job at fifteen, she yeah. worked in a gown shop. She had to leave because the manager just constantly harassed her and touched her and wanted more. This being the nineteen sixties, there wasn't a whole lot of retribution. Keeler subsequently left Rosebery and headed to London, where she found work as a cocktail waitress at a restaurant on Baker Street. It was here that she met Maureen O'Connor, who worked at Murray's Social Club on Beak Street in Soho, through which she was introduced to the owner, Percy Murray, uh, who then offered her a job at his club. Uh, Murray's was a cabaret club, which had first opened in 1913 and became known for its scantily clad showgirls, uh, of which uh, Keeler had been hired to be. By the 1950s, 65 showgirls were working at Murray's, putting on nightly performances for the benefit of its pervy clientele, and it was this role which was offered to Keeler. Uh, in case you're interested, Nick... Uh, Murray is sadly closed in 1975, so um, you can't go and enjoy its entertainment anymore. Is cabaret still a thing here in London? I, I don't know. I've... I know you've got this, not really cabaret, you've got like Spearmint Rhino or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's. I don't know if it was more respectable back then. I mean, right now, if you say you're going to Spearmint R Rhino and you think either Stag do or you think, eh, you know. <laughs> Just whenever someone says strip club, I just think of it, I immediately feel sticky. Yeah, it, it has a, a sticky feeling to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, the premises of Murray's is now actually the uh, location of a Spanish slash Welsh influenced restaurant called Mountain. Um, I don't know if it's joke. Spanish, but I I can't think. I'm trying to think of Welsh food. I think of leek paella. <laughs> I don't know if it's like a kind of jokey reference to. Murray's, but the uh, front page of the website has a, a big photo of some clams and some sausages on the front page. You know, maybe we're looking for a new business opportunity. Do you reckon they fuse the music as well? Like, so it's Spanish. Yeah, like with men's choir. But anyway, um, Murray's, most importantly, is yeah. where Keela met Ward. Yes, that's probably the most important part of this story, isn't <laughs> yes. it? Murray's is where she met Stephen Ward, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the go to quack doctor. Uh, for ce celebrities who needed their limbs bent in London at the time. Uh, the two eventually struck up something of a friendship, uh, which led to uh, Ward inviting Keeler to come and live with him at his home in Wimpole Mews. Keeler herself would also meet another person here named Peter Rackman. Um, we won't go too much into detail on Rackman because really he's kind of ancillary to the story. He's not important, he's just a sort of player in it. He's yeah. important in a lot of other respects in the sense that he, would, um, he was a landlord. Mm. And he employed a lot of abusive practices to extract as much rent out of people as possible. Mm. So 
I guess a lot of current day landlords might yeah. look up to Rackman. Landlords haven't changed much since the sixties. But he's important because um he would take Keeler as a lover, mm. who he would then leave get rid of Keeler for another person called Mandy Rice Davis, who became friends with Keeler. Mm. And he would provide them properties to live in. Yeah. And the properties to live in become important a bit later on. So anyway, yes. Stephen Ward obviously met Keeler at Murray's. He became the conduit for what she met other people as she lived with him. Mm. It was also his flat where she would bring back men to. And yeah. she had lots of different boyfriends from different backgrounds. She wasn't, you know, filled with any sort of racial prejudice because she had a lot of boyfriends who were of different ethnicities. I got the impression she was just an outgoing kind of sociable person who, who maybe didn't share a lot of culture at the times inhibitions. So Keeler was obviously living with Ward. He sort of controlled access to her. Yeah. But Ward's also important because he was also friends with another person mm. who's important to this story, and that's Eugene Ivanov. Mm. Now, Eugene Ivanov was a Russian naval attaché based in London and uh, was said to be there in an effort to sort of gather intel and undermine British interests. Right. Now, the reason he ends up meeting Ivanov in a weird way is because Stephen Ward was kind of a bit of a caricaturist, a sketch artist in a way. He mm. used to draw different people. In fact, you can his sketches are still being sold for quite considerable amounts of money. Mm. And he apparently had a huge desire, Stephen Ward, to to go to Russia and sketch the Politburo. Right. <laughs> so he was introduced to Ivanov because of this. Yeah. And the re- he was introduced to this person by Stephen Coote, who was the editor of the Daily Telegraph at the time, mm. who had been approached by Ivanov for for diff- basically Ivanov being nosy and trying to discover information. Yeah. So in order to get rid of him, he kind of introduced him to Ward. <laughs> yeah. This led to Ward being tapped up by MI5. Right. Who basically noticed his connection to Ivanov. Even before the affair started, Ward is already kind of balls deep in all of this then. He is. So he knows a Russian who's known by MI5 as possibly a, a, a spy. Yeah. Uh, he knows lots of young girls mm. who are having intimate relationships with powerful people, including people like Rackman. So he gets cosy with Ivanov. They become really quite close friends to the point that some observers around them have said that they talk about each other all the time. Mm. And some suggested they may even have had a relationship together. Yeah. Um, but yes, he used, as we said, used to organise these parties. Mm. And he organised one party in particular that led to the start of the Profumo affair. And that happened on a very monumental day. Do you know what day it happened on? Was it the uh, oh? Was it the fourth of July? You're four days off. Was it the? It's a monumental day to me. Oh, oh, it's that day. Oh, was it the? <laughs> it, it was the the weekend of the seventh to eighth of July, wasn't it? It was the eighth to the ninth, and it's the eighth to the ninth. The eighth. The... Christine Keeler met John Profumo on the eighth at the a pool eighth. party, 1962. The reason why we celebrate that day is because it's my birthday. Oh. The birthday you just gave me a card for. Oh. A month late. Oh. <laughs> okay. I honestly, I just give you, at some point in the year, I'll give you a card. And I, I was, one day, I'll get it on the right day. Fumo had been attending a dinner at Cliveden House. Yeah. With the Astors, a bunch of other dignitaries, including uh, the, the, the president of Pakistan. Ivanov was all, was also there at this particular party with Ward. So some of the guests weren't necessarily involved in the more formal occasion. Mm. But Ivanov was there with Keeler and some other young women mm. at this smaller gathering, which Profumo ended up going to. Yeah. And this is where he first met Keeler, Lady Isra. And she was apparently running around topless with a towel. As we say, some accounts say that she was in the nude. Some say she wasn't. Either way, Profumo was allegedly smitten at first sight. Profumo would later describe Keeler as a very pretty girl and very sweet while Keeler had no idea who he was, uh, but was impressed that he seemed to know the famous actress Valerie Hobson. <laughs> didn't stop her from shagging him. <laughs> um, yeah, it's at this party, uh, he didn't just meet Keeler, he met Ivanov, mm. who they actually raced together in the pool. Ah. Oh. So this event's important because of that meeting, but also because on this day, Ivanov also drove Keeler home. Yeah. When he was slightly drunk as well. And this is said to be the, the moment that they had the affair when yeah. he drove her home. But by all accounts, there's no actually, there's no real way of knowing if she did sleep with him. She'd never actually intimated she'd ever been with Ivanov before she then sold her story to the papers a few years later. Yeah, and it was sort of noted that Keela was generally in the past had been very open about her relationship, mm. who she'd slept with. So the fact that she would keep this secret until deciding to go to the paper 18 months later 
it doesn't quite fit. But we'll come to that in a bit because it's not necessarily a, a, a fault of hers. It's it could be the journalists. Yeah. But anyway, so yes, yeah, so this party Profumo meets Keela. Ivanov is seen to take Keela away privately, just home. Profumo approached Ward mm. because he was like, "Can I? Do you have her number?" And he was like, "Well, it's my number because she lives with me." <laughs> so this is where the relationship struck up. Yeah. By all accounts, Profumo and Ward were not friends. They yeah. barely knew each other. Right. And in fact, even when he starts seeing Keela, he doesn't really have that much association with Ward. They didn't really know each other. Yeah. Despite what papers tried to put the two together with. Profumo wasn't in need of an osteopath then. Oh, only a week later, mm. Profumo talks to Keela and says, shall we Shall we start something? Yeah. Well, not in those words, but, you know, let's shag, basically. He was, you up for it? Yeah. While his wife was away in his constituency visiting people. Not much gets said about Valerie Hobson, but... She, um, like Valerie knew the type of man he was. He was a bit of a, a womanizer. I mean, she chose to stay with him for the rest of her life. <sighs> her reasons, I guess, are I her own. I'm going to be too honest. I didn't dig too much deep into Valerie Hobson in her life, mainly because the source material I was looking at didn't talk about her that much, which is no. not, which is a, a fault on my part. But I, I can't really speak about her motives or desires. Well, Hob- Hobson had had a career as a relatively high-profile actor. When she married Profumo, she gave that all up to be what is essentially a housewife. And at that point, yes. she kind of goes into the background. Yeah, and that was the trouble with the time is that you couldn't have a career if, if your husband had a career. Yeah. And you had to sort of give it up rather unfairly. But yeah, Profumo states that he only ever had three liaisons with Keela, mm. which is quite frankly not true <laughs> based on... <laughs> What Keeler says, and based on the fact that MI5 would later be watching him and note his amount of occasions he would visit Ward's flat. Yeah. Uh, on some occasions, he would even be on holiday with his family. There's mm. one, one occasion when he was on the Isle of Wight and him and Keeler went off separately. Oh, he brought Keeler on holiday with his family? She just she was on the Isle of Wight. Yeah, they were unaware of it. Oh. Um, and they had sex in front of the TV and she made him sausages. <sighs> what a dick. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as you say, Profumo claimed that the uh, the affair was short, lasting only a few weeks. Ward, at some point, claims that he believed that Profumo intended to make it a long-term relationship, but then it's Ward's word. Uh, it was nonetheless an unromantic affair, uh, driven purely by Profumo's attraction to Keeler by the sounds of it. Profumo would later describe Keeler as completely uneducated, with no conversation beyond makeup, hair, and gramophone records, uh, which doesn't really suggest long-term commitment. His affair was short-lived over the span of, I think, just a, a month, month or two. Yeah, I mean, but he stupidly wrote notes to her on War Office-headed paper. Yeah, and one of those notes supposedly survived, which Keeler had as proof of this affair. It would come to bite him in the ass a bit. So on the 9th of August, just only a few weeks after, obviously, that he'd initially, well, actually, a month. Mm. month after he met Keeler. He was called in by the head of security services, Norman Brooke, mm. who was cabinet secretary. The result of that conversation was him writing the Dear Darling note saying, I can't see you, we must cancel this. Yeah. Something had spooked him. Yeah. Yeah. That is the point that the affair ended when he wrote the letter. Uh, Keeler later claimed that it continued for a while longer. The, this is also backed up by other materials that suggest that he did continue the affair Many from his children as well, who mm. said that he looks to have extended the fair beyond beyond the ninth as well. Yeah, where he was trying to apparently get Keela to leave Ward's flat, right, to make it less conspicuous that he was going to see her all the time. Yeah, um, but she refused to. Yeah, I mean he hadn't been subtle up to this point. I don't know why he was worried. Well, you now. say that, but he had employed one of the age-old uh, adulterous tricks of getting perfume for her that was exactly the same as his wife. Oh right. So what a scumbag. Like, yeah, just in case I smell like you, yeah. I want you to wear my wife's perfume. <laughs> All this while, though, Ward was obviously still chatting with Ivanov, mm. who kept trying to get him to act as an intermediary between the British government and him. Um, around this time, in this, you have the sort of growing Soviet-Cuban missile crisis. Ward was apparently in a coffee shop one day, overheard a conversation between two people talking about it. Yeah. And decided, as he always does, to butt in. It's right. like, look, you haven't heard the Soviet side. I know a Soviet you could talk to who could clear up everything for you. Yeah. Fortunately, who he was talking to were two quite high-ranking parliamentarians. <laughs> uh, one of which was a Tory backbencher, William Shepherd, who also happened to be in the pocket of MI5. So he was like, all right, 
I'll buy, I'll meet this Soviet person of yours. Yeah. Ends up going to meet Ivanov at Ward's flat. This is important because he notes the presence of Keeler in the flat, her familiarity with Ward and Ivanov, mm. which starts another ball rolling in the security services' heads. Okay. It's kind of all roads lead to Ward in this case, then, don't they? Yes. He, he'd also heard rumours that Keeler mm. had been involved with Profumo because yeah. rumours flew around like Westminster like nothing else. Yeah. And he noted that. And he noted all of this to his MI5 handlers. So MI5 was slowly getting this sort of collection of information about Profumo, about Keeler, about Ivanov, about Ward, about all these characters sort of thrown together. Mm. Um, what would bring this all to one glorifying, horrible, scandal ridden head yeah. was the events that followed directly involving Keeler's love life. Yeah. Which brings us to Lucky Gordon and Edgecombe. So the October after the affair allegedly ended, Keeler accompanied Ward to the Rio Cafe in Notting Hill. Uh, Notting Hill today is kind of a fancy area of London, but back then it was a little bit less fancy. Um, But anyway, this is where she met uh, Aloysius Lucky Gordon, uh, a Jamaican jazz singer with a history of violence and petty crime. I'd love to see you write a travel guide. This area is fancy. This area is less fancy. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with Notting Hill other than the carnival and the film. Your descriptive powers are astounding. It's L- like incredible. many areas of London throughout the 20th and 21st century, it has become more gentrified. But the, uh, the two embarked on an affair marked by violence and yet more petty crime uh, before Gordon was eventually arrested for assault after his continued harassment of Keeler. Later that month, Keeler moved in with an ex-merchant seaman from Antigua called Johnny Edgecombe, who was also kind of a dick, uh, (laughs) leading him to clash violently with Gordon, uh, at one point slashing him with a knife. Keeler broke up with Edgecombe uh, as well, not long after, uh, presumably deciding that knife-wielding maniacs perhaps weren't all they were cracked up to be. I thought you were going to say she wasn't cut out for that sort of relationship. That would have been better, wouldn't it? It would have been better, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what edits are for. (laughs) Okay, just splice that in. We'll be fine. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, so, uh, later on, on the 14th of December, Edgecombe reappeared at the house Keeler was then sharing with fellow model Mandy Rice Davis. When they refused to let him in, he fired several shots at the front door and was subsequently arrested and charged with attempted murder. Why this is important is because this shooting took place at Ward's flat. Yeah. So it drew attention to Ward's flat. Mm. He ended up actually moving into the flat that Rice Davis was living in. Okay who was Rack- Rackman's lover. Oh, he moved. was that Rackman's flat then, or had she left? Yeah, Rackman sort of owned all these sort of different buildings. Like he owned Bryson Mews, he owned uh, Wimpole Mews. Was it oh. Wimpole Mews? Yeah, Wimpole Mews, yeah. He owned all these buildings, and he would move people around that he liked or not. So right. She would actually, as a result of this shooting of Keeler's uh, boyfriend, yeah. shooting up the place, be kicked out of her home a home that she had even though it wasn't hers it came come to see and see as her, her own because she had furnished it with her own furniture and stuff but yes it's also important because Edgecombe was actually caught and it mm. led to a trial yeah. so the case for this shooting wouldn't actually come to, to, to bear until around beginning of January 1963 mm. but before then Keeler continued her sort of party-esque lifestyle uh, in fact she attended a number of different parties with people including one of which Hmm. was a a man called Paul Mann. Uh, So he was a business owner who made shirts, but described himself as a racing driver. Okay. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Maybe, no, I got got nothing. No. No, no. (laughs) Paul Mann, okay. Didn't live a button-down lifestyle. No. (laughs) I'll I'll stop, I'm sorry. So he attended a party with, with Keeler where basically she poured her heart out and was just like, oh, yeah, I fucked John Profumo and then I got shot at by my ex-boyfriend. And it's just like, and he was just sitting there going, you okay. can sell this to the papers, you know. But he also, she also told it in the presence of a, another person who was called John Lewis. Yeah, not the shop. Not, not the shop. He was a, a former politician. Yeah. Who absolutely despised Stephen Ward. He didn't like him as a person or an individual. Yes. he. Not only that, but he was also a Labour politician, which meant he was on the opposite team to Profumo. Indeed. Uh, what Paul Mann tried to do was try to get, get her to sell her story to the papers. Mm. 
Uh, whereas John Lewis went straight to another. Ser- he was he was no longer a serving MP. He went to another serving MP who's a Labour MP called George Whig. Yeah. Uh, and told him all about this story. And, and as you say, he took this information to his colleague George Whig, and Whig then began his own investigation. Meanwhile, Mann had succeeded in persuading Keeler. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, I kind of think about you know that sort of London slang. Oh uh, no. Man got Red Bull, man got Caramac. No, I would have, like, man, man. I know, like, hey, man, how you doing, man? In the traditional sense of man. Yeah, it's it's another sense of man. I'm just getting old. <laughs> man getting old. Man getting old. Anyway, Paul Mann convinced Keeler to go to the papers yeah. to sell her story, which she agrees to sell it for a price. Samira, who was at the time the Sunday pictorial. Who offered a grand. Yeah. A grand to her story. And basically, they sent two journalists around to sort of pump, pump her full of information. Hmm. To which, this is the point where she she talks about Profumo and Ward, and she mentions Ivanov. And this is where the sort of journalists implant the notion that, oh, did you have an affair with Ivanov? Did you, you know? And this is, it's kind of suggested that they sort of compelled her to sex up her story, really. Yeah. So it moves from being just a sort of boring affair between young girl and Tori to yeah. sp- lover of soviet spy oh it's now a spy scandal yeah 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 so it becomes this sort of sexy sexy thing well, well, however yeah because she went to the news of the world the editor who had now lost out on that story yeah decided to go other avenues to get his story he he contacted ward and he contacted <laughs> profumo yeah to get their side of the story yeah. to which immediately they were like oh my god <laughs> what's going on yeah so they they bring in the lawyers yeah Try and hash it out and prevent her from publishing the story. Yeah, they actually um, they actually contact Keeler directly and say, "Well, look, what's it going to take for you to, you know, shut up and go away?" Uh, the figure was five thousand. Five thousand. Five thousand. Yeah, she, she wanted recompense for loss of earnings, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, Ward, meanwhile, in the background, is working hmm. through this and brings up the editor of the Mirror and says, "Look, what she's saying is rubbish. Yeah. And if you try and print it, I'll sue you." Yeah. So the mirror relents, fearing libel. Mm. They drop the story, and Keela only gets two hundred of the thousand pounds promised to her. Yeah, okay, because it's so, two hundred up front, eight hundred yeah, when yeah. it's printed. And she learns that it's Ward who cost her that extra money. Ah, oh, okay. So th- this is important because we mentioned Rice Davis lost her house because of Ward. Yeah. And Keela has now lost money because of Ward. Yeah. So they they're building up a grievance against Ward. Uh, uh, one of the interesting also things is, is Profumo also asked. MI5 to suppress this story yeah. before Ward made it sort of go away. However, what makes life complicated is mm. the trial of Edgecombe. Yeah. Which seemingly had no would have no impact at all. However, Keeler was a witness in that trial. Yeah. So this was the case where Keeler's ex-boyfriend came and shut up the uh, the house she was living in. Yes. Yeah. And unfortunately, because it was a trial, the police needed to collect evidence from witnesses. So they had gone to Keeler yeah. and Rice Davis and gotten their stories. Mm. Keeler told them all about the story and the fact that she had had an affair with Profumo and then lost out on the money. Yeah. Rice Davis had basically talked about Ward in a less than flattering way, mm. which leads to the accusations that he was procuring girls for people. Uh, so his report detailed that Ward was procuring young women for wealthy individuals at, at Cliveden. Yeah. It wrote about Profumo's involvement with Keeler, including her own relationship with Ivanov. Yeah. Um, it also mentioned that she had proof of Profumo's affair with her via a letter, the Darling Letter. The da- yes, the Darling Letter. Do you know what the, can you tell us about the Darling Letter? Shall I read the Darling Letter? Read me the Darling Letter. Okay, you can imagine I'm saying this to you if you want. If it's... Do, a, do a posh accent. Darling, alas, something has blown up tomorrow. <laughs> can't do it. Darling, alas, something's blown up tomorrow night and I can't therefore make it. I leave the next day for various trips and then a holiday so I won't be able to see you again until sometime in September. Blast it! Please... (laughs) Please... Please take great care of yourself and don't run away. Love, Jay. So he's used blown it and blast it. Yeah. (laughs) It's quite quite explosive language, you might say. Blast (laughs) it! (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, so it's not, not the most romantic of letters. But what makes it important is that it was on officially headed Ministry of War government paper. Yeah. As we can see, Profumo, throughout this whole ordeal, uh, was relatively careless. I would say stupid. 
<laughs> stupid. You'd go that far. Yeah, I mean, he he was, to be fair, he wasn't particularly bright as a person and he did suffer from severe dyslexia as well. Right. But he, he acts in a sort of, I guess, maybe arrogant way, not stupid way, just yeah. to be fair. He, he's quite like, I can do what I like. I won't get caught. Well, it's under different circumstances. It probably would have been fine for him to be having an affair with this 19-year-old girl, given the well, time I don't period. Think, I don't think it was fine in any moral sense. Not, not in a moral sense, but he probably would have got away with it if it weren't for the involvement of Ivanov and Ward. Anyway, uh, these claims were taken directly to the government <laughs> after reading the report. The Attorney General, Sir John Hobson, interviews Profumo, yeah. who adamantly denies it all happened and says he will sue the pants off anyone yeah. who, who says otherwise. <laughs> right. Edgecombe trial starts and all the journalists are sniffing around it because they know the Profumo story, but they just can't release it because they haven't got definitive proof, they haven't got stories. But yeah. if Keeler attends the trial... And incidentally mentions these facts, which she was bound to. Yeah, because Keeler is notorious blabbermouth. But it's also relevant to the case, yeah. why she's in Ward's flat, etc., etc. They can print what they like. Yeah. Unfortunately, she doesn't turn up to the trial. Yes, isn't she in Spain? <laughs> she's in Spain. Yeah. So she claims she didn't know the dates of the trial. Yeah. But it all the but from what I read, there's a great suggestion that she was taken away by Paul Mann, yeah. the same guy who tried to get her to sell the stories, oh. to Spain intentionally so she wouldn't attend the trial because he knew yeah. if she went to the trial, they couldn't sell their story. Oh, okay. Right. Um, I, I found it kind of interesting that obviously we're saying that the newspapers are very reluctant to report on this story because of the threat of libel uh, and slander. Um, one kind of exception is actually the magazine Private Eye, which I didn't realise goes back that far. Uh, it was, it was kind of successor to Punch, wasn't it? Yeah, but they actually um, went as far as, as summarising the whole affair in detail, but simply changing the characters' names. So they had uh, <laughs> Mr. James Montessi, uh, Miss Gay Funloving, Mr. Spook, and uh, Vladimir Bolokov. <laughs> Perfect way to get around libel. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Keeler would resurface after the trial on the 25th in Spain, mm. to which she denied all knowledge of a Profumo affair and got paid 2000 for a photo shoot. The trial of Edgecombe proceeded regardless, and he was mm. sentenced for a lesser charge of uh, possessing a firearm with intent to endanger life. Mm. So he got seven years for that. Oh, OK. However, the rumours around Profumo were flying like, Nobody's business. Yeah. Led to a parliamentary debate. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, Whig, the politician Lewis had told, mm. used parliamentary privilege to ask the Home Secretary to categorically deny the truth of rumours concerning a certain minister with Keeler, Rice Davis and the Edgecombe shooting. It's a smart move. At the conclusion of the debate, the government's law officers and chief whip agreed that Profumo had to make a statement in the House. Yeah. Because he was adamant nothing had happened. So they said, well, if you've got nothing to hide... Go into the house, tell everyone you've got nothing to hide. Yeah, at this point, they just want to draw a line under it. So, in the early hours of 22nd of March, 1963, mm -hmm. John Jack Profumo, John Jack, it's a weird name, isn't it? John Jack. And his lawyers meet with ministers and craft their wording. Mm -hmm. Which is a bit odd when you think about it, because you should just be able to say, look, I did not have, I did not have relations with this woman. I can't believe this is the first time we, we have drawn a comparison to... <laughs> to Bill Clinton, yeah. To yeah. Bill Clinton. It's, uh, yeah. All, all getting hung up on Boris Johnson, Bill Clinton did it first. I got Hummer in the over office. Anyway, they, they agree on the wording. Uh, he stated, though, quite wrongly... Mm. <laughs> There was no impropriety. There was no impropriety whatsoever in my acquaintanceship with Miss Keela. Yeah. Uh, I shall not hesitate to issue writs for libel and slander if scandalous allegations are made or repeated outside the house. So ba back out there with the legal threats. And um, then... Say uh, one thing, I shall sue you, I shall sue you so good. That's it. After he was done uh, lying to the House of Commons, Profumo then went to spend the rest of the day at the horse races with the Queen Mother. Just going back to the day uh, Keeler re-emerged, Wig mm. had actually gone on TV to Panorama to talk about the case specifically around Ivanov mm. and had said a load of information about Ivanov. Right. Which was actually factually incorrect. Okay. 
Uh, so Ward, who had watched the broadcast, took it on himself to ring up Wig. So <laughs> actually, he didn't drive this car, he drove this car. He, and actually, he did this and this and this. He just didn't know when to stop, did he? He didn't know when to stop, to which point Wig said, why don't you come into Parliament and have a chat with me about this? Yeah. Um, hoping to sort of launch his own investigation into it. Mm. The chat didn't really have much impact for Wig. Yeah. But the fact that Ward had strutted into Parliament, mm. he was always flamboyant, made yeah. a lot of noise, draw, drew the attention of senior parliamentarians who thought, we've got to do something about this annoying twat. Yeah. The Home Secretary, Brooke, wanted to mm. charge Ward with something. Yeah. He didn't know what, but he wanted, he wanted to basically bring him down. Okay. Um, initially, he wanted to charge him under breach of the Official Secrets Act, but they couldn't charge him with that. Yeah. So he set about... It's one of those weird things where it wasn't an investigation into his crimes. It was mm. an investigation to see if he had committed any crimes. Oh, they were just kind of fishing. They there. were you're, you're raking for evidence, basically. So he yeah. set a bunch of detectives off to try and find dirt, basically. So they'd found the criminal before they'd found the crime. Yeah. So we talked earlier a little bit about sexual attitudes at the time. Mm. So in 1956, they introduced a new Sexual Offences Act. Mm. And it was a pretty, pretty weirdly worded, archaic sort of piece. Yeah. There were like clauses in it stating like, if a man pretends to be another woman's husband and has sex with her, he can be charged with rape. If a man pretends to be another... So if he impersonates and tricks a woman into thinking that he is her husband... Yeah. ...and has sex with her, you can charge him for rape. Did that happen often? It's a very strange situation, isn't it? I mean, it? identical twins... Or putting a bag over her head yep. and saying, hello, darling, it's or me. <laughs> or if you work only in the dark... It's it's just odd wording. It is odd wording. It feels like it doesn't need to be a specific it's, law. It's like you've just got these all these old men sitting around going, "Yeah, oh, what horrible situations can we imagine? You, you should be, I mean, just go, don't be tricking people into having sex with you. There was something yeah. under this act called Section 23. Okay. The rule effectively states that if you introduce your pal to yeah. a girl who's under the 21, yeah. even though the age of consent is 16, yeah. and they have sex... Yeah. Anywhere in the world. You're considered to be what, some kind of You're madam? You're considered to be procuring them for that activity. So it's, it's a very odd rule. So if, if you introduced two people and one of them was a 20-year-old girl and one was a 25-year-old man and they ended up hooking up like at some point in the future, you would be held culpable for that? Basically, yes. Yeah. So just to read what officially this yeah. <laughs> the act says... Um, it is an offence for a person to procure a girl under the age of 21 to have unlawful sexual intercourse in any part of the world with a third person. That, I mean, that the sort of thing, it sounds like it's been written specifically for a certain purpose, like somebody... <laughs> it's, got, it's got a second clause. Uh, okay. The second clause is a person shall not be convicted of an offence under this section of the evidence of one witness only, unless this witness is corroborated in some material, particular by evidence implicating the aroused. Sorry, imp- You're impl- out. Impl- <laughs> 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 implicating the accused. The I, accused. Freudian slip there. Okay. <laughs> um, it's odd because the age of consent is 16. Yeah. And this is specifically about under the age of 21. So it's, it's very it's very odd. It and it is... only applies to women. It doesn't apply to boys or men. The, the specific oh. word, at least in this section, it specifically says girl. It doesn't say uh, man, female. It just says girl. Oh, right. So you can introduce... What, uh, uh, two men? And, okay, the, the act of homosexuality was illegal, but the person who made the introduction would be fine. Well, it's not, think, not just thinking about homosexuality. If you, say, introduced a young man to an old lady... Oh, would that would be... also be bad. No, but, but that's the thing. Under this law, it doesn't specify man. Oh, it's always young girl it just... and older man. Um, well, I guess man, you know, over the age of 21. It's this idea 25. that women are sexual objects, basically. Men are yeah. not sexual objects. They are the conquerors. So it doesn't matter if they have sex. Right. So it's it's a very like antiquated law, and it doesn't make any sense because half the population are, would be guilty of this crime. Like yeah. If you were nineteen and you introduced your sister to your mate, yeah, and she, your sister was seventeen and he was, you'd be done. You could technically be done for procuration. Yeah. Not, not. It doesn't even have to be like here's my sister. You should have sex with her. It's like here's my sister. Yeah. That's 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 all you need to do. It's nice. a it's a very odd. Law. Yeah. This sexual act would have a huge implication for, for Ward because it's what they would use to charge him with. Because mm. obviously he hung around with lots of young women. They would obviously meet men and have sex. Boom, you're oh, guilty, mate. Easy charge there, yeah. then. Particularly when they would obviously contribute towards housekeeping bills. Okay. Which they could then try and use as proof that he was being pimping, basically. Right. 
The two detectives in question, Herbert and Burroughs, interviewed Keeler, mm. asking for a list of men she had been with. And she was interviewed a total of 24 times. So she admitted to having the perfumer affair. She admitted to being given gifts and stuff by other men who she'd seen. Bill Astor was also interviewed by the police, much to his shock, because obviously he was a straight-up Tory old-fashioned, like, me? Yeah. You're questioning me? Um, he, um... They tried to charge him with running a brothel. So Bill Astor was, uh, was deeply embarrassed by the association. He, he actually died not long after, in 1966, after which Cliveden was sold to Stanford University and is now a luxury hotel. And you can actually book out the experience. <laughs> the, the Profumo. Profumo experience. Do you yeah. think, I mean, do you do like, what do you do, like role play? It's a sign of the changing times that it's now a selling point. Imagine if in 60 years' time you could go into the Downing Street room where Boris had his birthday party. Like, this is where the cake was. Yeah. It's just like, it's a bit mad, really. Do you think people go to the Ovary office and go, oh, this is where Bill Clinton... I imagine every president does that. It goes like, where was the Hummer? Yeah. <laughs> where did he get polished? You, you know, Move Donald... the desk away from there. <laughs> you know, Trump probably did. I mean, Bill Astor, he must have been... Because he, obviously he was having his parties in his house. Ward was having his parties with young girls in Spring Cottage and the parties would mingle. Did that not put... put Make it a little bit risky with Bill Astor with this kind of introduction. It did, but you've got no evidence, really, that he was running a brothel. The, the charge was he was running a brothel. But he loses, Ward loses his privilege to stay at the cottage. Yeah. Where he has these parties. I don't think we ever mentioned the name of the cottage, did we? Uh, no, we did, it, it was Spring Cottage. But Spring it's, Cottage, it's, yeah. yeah. The police used every sort of nefarious mean that they could to extract evidence from people. Hmm. They tried to get Keeler to use Lucky Gordon as a witness to Ward's crimes. Yeah. After basically luring him into a trap where he, she got assaulted weirdly by another friend's brother mm. and she got asked to say it was Gordon. Right. But it wasn't. Yeah. He refused to play ball, wouldn't, wouldn't testify against Ward. Yeah. Um, they went after Rice Davis. Mm. She had been given a car and a driving license by Rackman. She got charged for driving without insurance and having a fraudulent license. Yeah. They sent her to Holloway. Oh, what, the women's prison? Holloway. Yeah. For, for this charge, mm. where they sort of demeaned her, shaved her pubic hair and stuff, and put her in a cell for yeah. eight days. For driving offences. <laughs> for driving offences. Yeah. Until she confessed about Ward being the horrible pervert he was. She got released from prison, went away on holiday to, to relax, came back and got arrested again. Yeah. On a charge of uh, stealing a TV. Oh, right. And they did that so that she they could have her in custody until the trial came about for Ward, so she would testify in person. Oh, okay. So it's all very like... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are... There are no... It's just like... I mean, on the on the face of it, you think, oh, Profumo, he's the bad guy. He, he had an affair. And then you go, oh, no. No, nobody's hands are clean here. Ward, meanwhile, had knew this was going on because the police were harassing his patients. He went to MI5 to complain. He met Macmillan's private secretary, Timothy Bly, yeah. on the 7th of May. Uh, to ask that they end the police inquiry. He added that he had been covering for Profumo. So actually, funny enough, when the Edgecombe trial was breaking, he went on TV to announce Profumo was a stand-up guy, there's no affair going on. And so in this meeting, he basically says, look, I lied. I covered for Profumo for you. Why are you chasing after me? Yeah. He, he got told by, by the Bly that he couldn't do anything. Doesn't he then try to go to the press, but the, they, they don't want to print the story? Yep. Don't don't want to know. All this for Roy that Ward had been caused was enough to provoke the Prime Minister to ask his Lord Chancellor to investigate possible security breaches, which mm. leads us to Profumo coming back to England from holiday. Yeah, so on, on the 31st of May, Profumo and his wife uh, are on holiday in Venice when Profumo receives a message asking him to return as soon as possible. Um, obviously, having a bit of guilt in his mind, uh, he assumes that his lie has been exposed. And he promptly admits the entire affair to his wife. Uh, the couple return immediately and find that Macmillan is now on holiday. So Profumo decides to come clean to Bly instead. Uh, Profumo promptly resigns from government and requests to be removed as MP. Uh, the day after Profumo makes his confession, Ward is arrested and charged with immorality offences. It's also the, the day... Profumo's resignation is made public as the start of the trial of Gordon mm. for his attack on his supposed attack on Keeler. So it all sort of comes to a head at the same time. And a few days later on the 7th, he's found guilty principally on the evidence that Keeler gives, which is entirely false. So Keeler 
<laughs> also commits perjury. Because Profumo had resigned admitting to this, the newspapers decided now they can actually go full tilt with this. Mm. They published Keeler's account. Yeah, it's it, they called it, uh, well, the News of the World called it Confessions of Christine, uh, uh, which uh, attempted to portray Ward as a sexual predator and a probable tool of the Soviets. The Sunday Mirror went on one further and printed the infamous Dear Darling letter. Um, so it was a pretty bad day for Profumo. It was a terribly bad day for him, and it led to intense scrutiny from the opposition to the government, leading to a series of debates about security for the government, whether they were fit and able to carry on. Mm. It caused Macmillan a great deal of stress and headache. Yeah, so at this point, it all became a bit of a free-for-all. Uh, so not only were the papers discussing the scandal of a cabinet minister lying to the House, uh, but the entire government's viability was also being brought into question. Uh, David Watt in The Spectator defined Macmillan's position as an intolerable dilemma from which he can only escape by being proved ludicrously naive or incompetent or deceitful or all three. And horrible, horrible vitriol and hyperbole was thrown around regarding Steve, in Parliament regarding Stephen Ward and Christine Keeler. Christine Keeler was referred to as a prostitute, a tart, a slut. Yeah. Ward was con- referred to as a treasonous spy. Mm. It was all getting rather flammatory. Um, and... The government held a vote on its handling, and we say narrowly they won, but very narrowly, and lots of Tories abstained. Yeah. And uh, reduced their majority by quite a chunk. Yeah, 27 abstained. So the government's majority was only 69, which, if we were a more childish podcast, we might have something to say about. Ward was eventually committed for trial on charges of living off the earnings of prostitutes and procuration of girls under 21. Um, he was released on bail, but ultimately the trial would be his undoing, mm. resulting in the sad suicide yeah. of Ward. He took his own life. Yeah, so he actually he, he overdoses on, uh, I believe, sleeping pills, is taken to hospital, and is then tried in absentia while he's in a, a coma in hospital. Um, he's found to be guilty and then dies from the overdose. Yes, yeah, so his trial was actually held at the Old Bailey. It was, it was deemed that serious. Uh, the, I mean, I thought the, the judge was particularly brutal in, in his ruling. He actually draws attention to the fact that none of Ward's supposed society friends had been prepared to speak up for him. Yeah, and to make matters worse, uh, Keeler's testimony had found to be false in her previous trial mm. against Gordon. The prosecution did not make the other... <laughs> Members of the court aware that Keeler's testimony had been had been found to be unreliable in the other case. Yeah. And she was one of the main prosecution witnesses in this case, along with Rice Davis. Yeah. So it was very stacked against him. Yeah, Ward had a pretty rough time of it. Mm. Anyway, the government decided to commission a report looking mm. into the whole affair to see if they'd done anything wrong or if they could do anything better, as, as these reports always do. Yeah, the report was actually assigned to uh, Lord Denning. In his report, which was published on the 26th of September... Uh, actually concluded that there had been no security leaks in the Profumo affair and that the security services and government ministers had acted appropriately and ultimately placed most of the blame on Ward, who he described as an utterly immoral man whose diplomatic activities were misconceived and misdirected. Uh, some people have said this report was actually garbage. <laughs> it's just a way to sort of clear the government of any wrongdoing. Yeah. I, I mean, um, Denning was quite a well-respected judge, but in this instance, yeah... Uh, people have said it brought down the government. Uh, despite calls for Macmillan to resign, he refused. Mm. He said, no, I'm carrying on. Look at us. We've done everything right. I've done everything we could have possibly done right. We got lied to. Yeah. But eventually he did resign shortly after, but not because of the trial itself. He was convinced he had cancer. He was quite ill. Yeah. Yeah, he um, he resigned, convinced he had a um, terminal cancer. He was wrong. And he ended up living another 20 years, though. But he was replaced by Alec Douglas Holm, who led the Conservatives to a a narrow defeat in the next year's general election, uh, leading to Harold Wilson becoming Prime Minister with the Labour Party. What happens to Profumo and Keeler? So, Profumo largely disappeared from public life following the scandal, uh, instead choosing to work as a volunteer at Toynbee Hall, which was a charity in Spitalfields, which supports the most deprived residents in the east end of London. 
uh, he continued to work with the charity for the rest of his life, uh, which would eventually lead to him being awarded a CBE in 1975. Despite the affair, uh, Profumo's marriage with Valerie Hobson lasted until her death in 1998, aged 81, with him eventually following in 2006, aged 91. So he actually lived to a fair old age. Keeler pleaded guilty to perjury in December 1963 and was sentenced to nine months imprisonment, of which she served uh, six months. She was married twice, uh, each time producing a child, uh, the elder of which was raised by Keeler's mother. Both relationships ultimately failed, leaving Keeler to live largely alone from the mid-1990s until her death in 2017, aged 75. Ivanov, uh, in case you're wondering, he, he also disappears from public life. Um, he goes back to Russia and uh, when he's recalled in 1963. In 1992, he reappears and writes his memoirs. Arguably, the Prefim Affair had a greater effect on, on our political establishment, our media establishment. No longer were politicians treated with respect, mm. but with suspicion. And it sort of changed the, the nature of the Conservative Party, at least, I mean, I disagree with this to some extent, from an aristocracy-based party into a sort of meritocracy-based party. Yeah, allegedly, the Profumo Affair and, and the changes it causes in the Conservative Party are what lead to someone like Margaret Thatcher becoming leader in the 1970s. But it worked well for them. They were quite successful with Margaret Thatcher. She was very successful. She was about yeah. for years, wasn't she? Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> for better or for worse. But that was the Profumo affair. I think a lot of it can be put down to Profumo's carelessness, Keeler's naivety, Ward's ego. It all comes down to the character flaws of the people involved. I don't think there are any winners. As is tradition, I have prepared a short quiz for you, Nick. I've forgotten what the score is. I haven't been keeping total. It doesn't matter. I was winning. It's okay. No, 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 no. you weren't. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't know. I, I will preface this. Of course you wouldn't know. I will preface this by saying that I wrote my quiz without actually looking at your research notes. So some of these questions are going to be a little bit easy. I'm a bit worried about this. Don't worry. It'd be nice. Um, are you going to... So we're going to play the uh, dramatic quiz music. Yes. Start starting now. <laughs> I keep telling you we don't, you don't need to do sound effects. <laughs> so, <laughs> so question number one. While working at Murray's, Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis stayed at a house in Marlebon owned by Peter Rackman, who kept them as his mistresses. Mm. What does Rackmanism mean? Is it A? When a landlord lets his tenants stay rent free? Is it B, when a landlord exploits or intimidates his tenants? Or is it C, when a landlord invites girls from the local cabaret club to come and live in his flat? <laughs> oh, I think Rackham would love it to be C or A, but it's actually B. Yeah, it's, he coined that term. It was it, B. He yeah. was an awful person. He basically bought all these terrible properties, did barely anything to them, and yeah. then charged people exorbitant rents. Yeah. And, to, and got away with it for a while. He's the sole reason we have better rental laws. To me, he is the villain in this story. As, as an ex-renter. B for a bastard. B for bastard. Or B for Belland, you choose. Number two. Who played John Profumo in the 1989 film adaptation of The Affair called Scandal? Was it A, Ian McKellen? Is it B, Patrick Stewart, or is it C, John Hurt? I don't know this. Mm. Oh, this is a tough one. <laughs> this is going to have to be a, a complete guess. Yeah. I don't think it was Patrick Stewart. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say John Hurt. It was actually Ian McKellen. Oh. It was a bit of a trick. John Hurt actually played Stephen Ward in that film oh, adaptation. Okay. Oh, you right. could see John Hurt playing that role. Yeah. Yeah. I would have thought I would have thought Ian McCann's quite tall. 
So he would play Stephen Ward, who was the more charismatic one. Whereas, as much as I love John Hurt, he's a short, dumpy-looking man. I'd so. have, I haven't seen the film, but in my head, I would have done it the other way around. Ian McKellen is the charismatic. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. Yeah. Jo- I, I love John Hurt, but that's the reason that he was picked for, for 1984, because he is the sort of like quite grey, drone-esque-looking person. And that's yeah. kind of what Profumo was like. He was charming, but he was kind of an ordinary-looking bloke. Yeah. Whereas McKellen's tall and charming like Ward was. So question number three. In his song... We didn't start the fire. Billy Joel refers to the Profumo affair with the line, British politician sex. Which line comes before it? (laughs) Is it A, JFK blown away? Is it B, Lawrence of Arabia? Or is it C, stranger in a strange land? Oh yeah, I have no idea. These are good (laughs) questions, I have no idea. I can sing it to you if it would help. I'm gonna say JFK blown away. JFK blown away. None of the other two makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Question number four. In the wake of the Profumo affair, Harold Macmillan stepped down after health problems led him to be convinced he was dying. He was, of course, wrong and lived for another 20 years. Which industry did Macmillan go on to work in during his retirement? Was it A, banking, B, insurance, or C, publishing? Publishing. Right, he was, of course, part of the famous Macmillan publishing family. Yeah, when he got married, it said that quite a few famous authors and poets attended his wedding. Yeah. Before his unhappy marriage to a woman that cuckolded him for quite a few years. Yeah. Yeah. There's this weird thing at the time when he got married that if even if your wife had an affair, you as the gentleman had to pretend you had an affair in order to have a divorce. Yeah. It... And he refused to do that because he was quite a straight-laced, boring guy. You know, he had toast and eggs for breakfast every morning he was Mm. quite frugal and he believed in like truth and righteousness yeah okay good question number five Mm -hmm. what was the name of christine keeler's 2012 autobiography was it a secrets and lies was it b legs and thighs or was it c sausages and pies (laughs) i'd really love it to be sausages and pies there's uh secrets and lies Secrets and lies, that's correct. Yeah. That was an easy one. <laughs> it's sausages and pies. I thought, she did cook Profumo sausages by yeah, one she, account. He so. did. As far as I thought it might be an, um, you know, a clever... That was, look- a, that was a good quiz. Four out of five, not bad. Not bad. Cool. Well done. Yeah. You'll catch up with me eventually. <laughs> I'm actually generally impressed. Well done. Thank you. You put thought behind that. Yes, I did. Lots of thought. Yeah. So that was our, our episode on the Profumo affair. Uh, I, hope you, I hope you found it. Engaging, uh, scandalous, sexy, swinging. I'm running out of words here. Stimulating. Stimulating, yes. But yeah, anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, as always, please please do feel free to get in touch with us. We're info at show. Other than that, I think all that's left is to say goodbye and, and leave you with the clue for the uh, next episode. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. Wrong. I can't stand the pain.